Hi, good morning, Linda Milton here. We welcome you to Sunday service. We've been here watering the new grounds, the new plantings, and uh, we hope you get to see it soon. And I'm Judy Johnson, and I welcome you also to the service. I hope you're having a great 4th of July weekend, and we want you to stay safe and healthy. joining us this week. We're really glad that you could be here with us and uh, hope that you have a good experience with us today through this uh, video worship service. Um, especially welcome those who may be new to this broadcast, somebody who might have just stumbled upon us or was told by somebody to take a look. We're, we're especially glad that you're here with us today. Today we're going to begin not with our typical confession, but with what's called the remembrance of baptism. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because this is one of the central focus uh, points of our Christian life. Uh, we are welcomed into God's community through this service of baptism. And so it's good to every once in a while remember our baptism and to give thanks for the gift of being welcomed into that, uh, into that community. Plus, you'll hear a little bit more about it in the message time. So let's take a moment to gather ourselves and, and prepare us for worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light, and our salvation. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Not only are we unified by baptism, this shared welcoming, this shared 
gift of the Spirit and, and call to ministry that we have at, at whatever age we're baptized. We also have unity in a couple of other things. One is the ancient creed that we call the Apostles' Creed. And so join me if you know it. If not, just listen along and, and hear the specific claims of faith that Christians around the world share together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And you've probably noticed by now that I'm standing next to this candle and the font. If you're not familiar with how this works, this is what we call the Christ candle. It's the candle that's lit at baptisms, at funerals, and at certain uh, festivals of the church. It reminds us each and every day that Christ, the light, is in the midst, not just of our church, but in the midst of our worship and in the midst of all that we do. And so we remember this particular candle and its lighting because it too unifies the church of Jesus Christ. And finally, we're unified by that prayer that he gave to the disciples when they asked, Lord, teach us to pray. And he gave them this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the ninth chapter of Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is from Romans 7. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. 
So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Word of God, word of life. Hi everyone, we're here again this week. It's me, Pastor Peter, and of course my friend Mark here. As you can see, Mark is trying to be really smart. He's wearing his mask and he's socially distancing. Now, not from me because we're together all the time, but he wants to make sure that he's healthy and I hope that you're trying to do the same at your house or wherever you go. Do you know what I'm standing next to? I'm standing next to what's called the eternal flame. Now, eternal means forever, but it doesn't mean that this candle will necessarily burn forever. Eventually, the wax will burn down and we'll have to replace the candle. But it is eternal in the sense that with this candle burning all the time, even when we're not in church. It's safe, by the way. You don't have to worry about a fire in the church. But when this candle burns, it reminds us that Jesus is never gone from our lives. He doesn't take a vacation. He doesn't stay in his house because of coronavirus. He is always in our life. And this candle reminds us of that. And it reminds us of hope. It reminds us that even when things are really, really rough, Jesus is there with us and for us. So next time you're here in church at Trinity, which I hope is soon, <laughs> but next time you're here, I want you to make sure to come and look at this candle. And I want you to think about how Jesus is in your life all the time, no matter what. Okay, well, I hope you have a great week. Mark hopes you have a great week. And again, follow his example. Stay safe. Bye-bye. This is the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 11th chapter, verses 16 to 19 and 25 to 30. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the gospel of our Lord. Some of you already know this, so it won't be a huge surprise, but others it may. When I tell you that I spent the summer of 1993 in prison, 
let that soak in. Well, I was at a prison. I wasn't actually in prison. You see, after the first year of our seminary training, we have to do something called clinical pastoral education, or CPE. It's a time when you kind of learn how to be a chaplain with people. <laughs> you don't, uh, you're not doing the book work as you would normally. Now, typically, CPE is done in a hospital, and you're assigned to a ward uh, where you're the chaplain on call. I chose a different path. I chose a different setting, um, and that was Mendota Mental Health uh, Facility in Madison, Wisconsin. I did in part because my family's from there. I could spend some time at home during the summer. Uh, but also because I wanted a, just a little bit of a different experience, and a different experience is what I got. Mendota is a place where if, you are, uh, if you've committed a crime in Wisconsin, but you are found uh, not guilty by reason of mental defect, or there's some reason why you won't enter the typical prison system, um, this is where you go. But it is not any kind of country club. It is not any kind of easy situation. It is incarceration, and it is difficult. And I spent that summer working with the men on my unit, doing Bible studies, uh, listening to their stories, uh, working with them on whatever, uh, whatever, made, whatever made sense, whatever the nurses and the doctors and the staff asked me to do. I will never forget it. The men that I met there, their stories were remarkable, tragic, sad, difficult. Um, and again, I will never forget them or that experience. I learned two other things, too. The first was very early, maybe it was the first day, the head psychiatrist said, if someone tells you a story, don't believe it unless they can produce keys. Because if they have keys, that means they're staff. If they don't, that means they're not. And so I remembered that. And you hear a lot of stories when you're in a place like that, but I always made sure to look for or ask for keys. But the second thing was more important, and this wasn't necessarily a lesson that was meant to be taught, but it was one that became clear very quickly. Even in a place like that, which is difficult and hard, and in some ways very frightening, even in a place like that, there's hope. Hope. It's not hope for huge things necessarily, but it's hope within the context of the situation. For some of the men, it was hope that their favorite meal would be served that day. For other men, it was hope that at some point they would earn the privileges to be outside in the yard where they could feel the breeze and smell the air and, and see trees. For others, it was to go beyond that. The dining hall was a little bit away from our unit. You could actually go outside and walk on a sidewalk and, and go to the dining hall. There was hope. Yes, maybe small things. But in a place that would seem completely hopeless, there were these glimmers, these rays of, of sunshine. And these men taught me that even in the darkest and most difficult of moments, you can squeeze out, wring out a, a moment of hope. Because without that, there's no life. Without that, the despair will crush you. It will destroy you. Our first lesson from Zechariah calls us prisoners of hope. And 
I've often found that as an odd turn of phrase. We are prisoners of hope. Now, what does that mean? You know, for those of us who who aren't incarcerated or maybe not uh, long-term hospitalized or, or for those of us who have relative freedom of movement even during this time, we say, well, we're not prisoners, but we are. We're held by hope. We are captivated. We are captives to hope. That is the center of our faith. It's the center of our faith because what you saw earlier, standing at the font and standing at the Christ candle and now standing here at this eternal light reminds us that in the darkness, as Christians, sometimes all we have is hope. We cling to it. It's part of what happens when we are welcomed at baptism into the community of Christ, when we are baptized into His death and resurrection. It's a, it's a curse in a certain way, but a happy curse if there is such a thing. Because as Christians, we say, no matter what, we know that Christ is with us. We know that there is light. We know that there is resurrection from death, and that is our hope. It's captured in that old uh, hymn, O love that will not let me go. We are prisoners of hope. And many in our culture are just plain prisoners, not just locked up in a facility not just incarcerated behind bars and cement walls, but prisoners of addiction, prisoners of failure, prisoners of abuse, prisoners of all sorts of common things. And as Christians, we have to offer them hope. We have to say to them, that prison can be broken. Those prisons, those bars, those things that lock us up can be unlocked. I told you the first day there I learned don't trust anybody who doesn't have keys. Well, as Christians, we can trust somebody who does have keys, the keys to the kingdom not just Peter the Apostle, but Jesus himself, the one who could give the keys. We can be freed from these prisons. We can be freed from the things that chain us. We can be free if we remember that we are first prisoners, captive to the grace that comes first from the cross and then through the Holy Spirit. So, you're a prisoner and wear it proudly because if there's anything that Christians can do, if there's anything we need to do in the world today, yes, we need to feed people, yes, we need to clothe people, but we do it all because we are prisoners of hope. And we know, as the gospel reminds us, that when we know Jesus, when we come to Jesus, He offers us a light burden. He offers us gentleness and peace. That burden is light because He carries it for us. And that hope is certain because he has the keys to unlock any prison. Amen.
called into unity with one another and the whole creation. Let us pray for our shared world. We pray for the church. Sustain us as we share your word. Embrace us as we struggle to find our common ground. Lift up leaders with powerful voices and free us from stagnant faith. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the well-being of creation. Protect the air, water, and land from abuse and pollution. Free us from indifference in our care of creation and direct us toward sustainable living. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the nations of our world. Guide our leaders in developing just policies and guide difficult conversations. Free us from patriotism that hinders relationship building and lead us to expansive love for all people. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We pray for all in need, for all who are tired, for all who feel in despair, who are sick or oppressed, and especially those we name now either silently in our hearts or with our voices. Take their yoke upon you and ease their burdens. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for our church, Trinity Lutheran. Bless Pastor Peter and all of our congregational leaders. Energize ministry volunteers, youth leaders, church administrators, and those who maintain our building and property. Shine in this place that we might notice the ways your love transforms our lives. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We give thanks for those who have died in the faith. We welcome them into your eternal rest and comfort and comfort us in your grief until we are joined with them in new life. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O oh God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
now for the week ahead, I invite you to grow in God, care in Christ, and serve in the Spirit.